talking with the kids this morning, I can't, I can't help but picture in my mind, I don't know what commercials it is, but you know the commercials with the guy sitting around with the kids all around the table, and he asked them, would you rather have something of this, 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 or this, 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 this? you know, would you rather have small or large? Would you rather have, would you rather have, have short or tall? You know, and they always reply, of course they would rather have, you know, the more. They want more. More is better. Old or new. They want what? The new. That has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon. I just couldn't help but think of that. Maybe it does. You know, I can still picture in my mind's eye about, I don't know, now it's 32, 33, 34 years ago, past 2000 for all you old people out there. Me and, and Mark and, and Bo and and Brad, I'm not sure who else was there on that day, but oh, what a day it was. We were playing football on the front lawn of Somerset High School, just as we did almost every single afternoon. The field, the field was a lush blue grass with just a hint of clover. It had a, it had a slight slope from west to east, or was it, oh, it was east to west. On the north, the out-of-bounds was the parking lot, the reserved spaces for the administration building, which would have posed a problem, but Brad's dad was the superintendent, so it was okay. One of the cars was his. On the south, the out-of-bounds was a sidewalk, which led from the large steps leading up to Somerset's library down to College Street, following that nice slope. One side of the east, one of the end zones, was a sidewalk. And the, the other was a sidewalk as well on the west side. We always kicked off to the west, though. Always, always, always. Because if you were traveling west and the quarterback overthrew the receiver, you would be led into oncoming traffic on College Street. And that was not a good thing. It was a busy street. You want to make sure always, always, that you were tackled inbounds. Because the concrete was not friendly. It did not make for a soft landing. Oh, did I mention in the northwest corner of the big oak tree? Watch out for the roots which made it their way onto the field. It was a vicious game. I mean, it was. Four on four or five on five. There were no gimmies or let me pass gently. It was an all-out war. Usually consisted of a, of a bloody nose or two, a fat lip or two, several strawberries on the knees and the elbows. This was no place for sissies. This was a man's game. We were nine and ten-year-old professional backyard football players. We were. And everything was trekking along just fine that day. Field of battle, it was always normal until it happened. I can't remember if it was it was pass interference or or interception or a fumble or or a catch out of bounds, but it almost escalated into an all out brawl. The opposing team captains they, they could not agree on the correct call. Play had come to a standstill. It was an impasse. There was nothing else could be done. There was no coach's challenge. There was no let us take a moment and review the replay to see what actually happened. Neither side would give an inch, okay? And just when things were about to get really, really ugly, cooler 10-year-old heads prevailed. And I'm not sure who said it, but they, they said it. No, I think they actually yelled it. They yelled, do over, do over, fine. Fine. Okay. When all else fails and neither side can agree, the only alternative to keep play moving is what? Is to do over. The ball would simply be returned to the point of the previous play. The make-believe clock was wound back. The down would just have to be played over. It was as if the previous play just never took place at all. All was forgotten and the game continued as if the play in question Never happened at all. Besides, it wouldn't do any good to argue over the call or carry it, the, the frustration onto the field. It was a do-over. So we huddled up. Okay, We huddled up. And it started out being drawn on a hand, the play. You know, 
Start out being drawn on hand. And then it moved to my chest for clarity's sake. Just so we everyone could see. Okay, so we lined up. Okay? We snapped the ball. And Brad, I, I think, drifted back. Drifted back, and the opposing team is closing in. And just whenever they were about to get there and he was about to throw the ball, Mark, I think, whizzed around behind him and took the ball from his hand. It was it was the infamous Statue of Liberty play. It was. It was. And Mark took the ball, and he was weaving across, and they're chasing him. And just whenever they're about ready to get to him, he stops and left-handed. Mark was left-handed, the only left-handed quarterback in the backyard football league. And he drilled it right across the middle and hit me right between the numbers. He did. And I took off sprinting toward the end zone and three or four, maybe a dozen tackles later, I was in the end zone and spiking the ball. We'd won the game. At least that's how I remember it. (laughs) Celebration ensued. Too bad I could not get a do-over to fix my ripped shirt before I walked home. My mom wouldn't even care if we'd won the game. Winning wouldn't get the grass stain out of my jeans, my new jeans. And it certainly wouldn't sew up the tear in my shirt. I mean, I would have to suffer the consequences. But mind you, football jerseys were meant to be worn and played in, not displayed, so it was okay. Probably get a firm scolding, some extra chores, and a promise from me that I would not play in my good school clothes anymore. At least until tomorrow, when we would have the rematch. You ever wish in your grown-up life that you could just get a do-over? I mean, that's how many of us view the start of a new year, isn't it? A chance to get it right this year. We wish we could do-over. We'll drop those one or two or ten extra pounds we've picked up over the past year. We'll join a gym, or at least we'll exercise and finally get back into shape. We'll make better financial decisions this year, won't we? We will save. We will invest. We will pay off our debt. We will tithe to the church. We will give more to charity this year. We'll refine that resume, finally get our our dream job. We'll go back to school, maybe, and get that advanced degree so we are more marketable and we can command a higher salary. You know one that is more commensurate with someone of our caliber? We'll end those destructive, codependent relationships. We'll seek out new and productive ones. We'll end the self-destructive behaviors and bad habits the negative self-talk or the smoking or the excessive drinking. We'll spend more time with family. Quality time with those whom we love. We'll start the day off right. Reading our Bible. Reestablishing that morning quiet time. We'll check a thing or two off of our bucket list this year. Yes, the New Year's resolutions. At least for the first week or two. It's a chance at a do-over. It's a chance to wipe the slate clean. We're gifted with a clean slate. Now, some of you are old enough to remember a slate. How many of you? Uh, we won't have to raise hands. You know, now they don't even have blackboards in class. They have whiteboards and 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 all this other technology stuff. But can it really happen? Can a a clean slate really happen? I'm not sure that that a few days or weeks or, or months of new behavior will cancel out years of bad or self destructive behavior. But any improvement is just that, right? It's an improvement. You can't undo what's been done. You can start fresh, though, and have a new beginning. Can't always escape the consequences of poor decisions or wrong actions. Gee, thanks. I know that's what you're saying. You had me feeling all good about myself now, Pastor, and and you leveled the truth to me. Way to pick me up. It's kind of a good news, bad news sort of thing. 
in life we often don't get a do-over. But with God, see, that's the good news. With God, He does wipe our slate clean. We get to make a fresh start, whether it is a new year or a new week or a new day. We get to make a fresh start. In Psalm 103, which we read today, we find out God is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger, not like some of us. He is abounding in love. He will not always accuse, and He doesn't harbor His anger against us forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. It says, as far as the heavens are from the earth, is His great love for us, for those of us who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, you know, one football end zone to the other. He's removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that good news? God doesn't give us what we deserve. And God doesn't love us because of what we do or who we are. God loves us because of who He is. It is possible to start off this year, 2014, with a clean slate. And I'm not sure what your past looked like. And, and frankly, God really doesn't care. He knows where you've been. He knows what your life looked like before. But He sees what your life can be. He sees the potential in you. And He loves you just the way you are. But He also loves you far too much to leave you that way. Our second passage in Scripture is the second part of a familiar story, at least if you were here through the story this year. You've heard the story of Jesus calling Matthew a tax collector, who was most likely a very dishonest person. He was a thief. He took money that didn't belong to him, and Jesus wants Matthew to follow him. And so he calls him and says, follow me. And Matthew leaves his old life and follows Jesus. And then he throws a party and invites all of his center tax collector friends and invites his new friends, Jesus and these other group of misfits that he hangs out with called disciples, in hopes that maybe the salt and the light will just rub off on his old sinful friends. And those who were righteous, those good Pharisee and John's disciples, good church people. They wondered why Jesus would associate with such sinful people. I mean, common trash, scum. Jesus bluntly points out to them what? It's not those who are well that need a doctor. It's the sick. I didn't come for those who don't think they need me. I came for those who are leading a lifestyle that is very far from God. I came to call them to repentance. So they question Jesus about his disciples' lack of religious behaviors. John's disciples and these Pharisees, they fast. Your disciples don't fast. They give a tenth of all they have, including their spices. To the church, your disciples don't do that. And so he shares them two parables. One about unshrunk cloth and a patch and Another one about wineskins. But, but the point was simple and the point was the same. You don't just try to cover up bad behavior with good actions in hopes of fooling everyone. See, Jesus came to set people free. He came to offer them a clean slate, a fresh start, a new beginning. But to get this new beginning, they had to let go of the old. See, they couldn't follow him and stay where they were. It just wouldn't work. He wasn't improving upon the old law. He said he came to fulfill it. He was making all things what? New. He came offering mercy and compassion rather than judgment and condemnation. Oh, he made no excuses for past sins but he offered a new beginning, a new path. And all the stories we read about Jesus, he repeatedly said to them what? Go and sin no more. So just like a new year offers you a chance to, to seek, 
a new self, to make some good goals, a, a new or renewed relationship with Jesus Christ offers the opportunity to remove your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. I mean, his great love for you will cover over all your sins. There's no excuse for your sins, and nothing that you can do on your own can repay God. Nothing that you can do on your own can cover it up. But if you lay them down, lay them down, and truly start off this year, this day, you can have a clean slate. Today, we're, we'll celebrate Holy Communion. See, Jesus Christ is still calling sinners. He's still saying, come and follow me. It's good news for sinners like me. See, you can't stay where you are and follow Jesus where he's leading you. It doesn't work. So this morning when we practice communion, and in the United Methodist Church we practice open communion, which means you don't need to be a member of this church or any church. Scripture says you need to seek to live in harmony, harmony with your neighbors, earnestly repent of your sins, and desire a new relationship with Jesus Christ. Begin that life-giving relationship. You can have a clean slate. But you need to leave something. You need to, to leave your sin at the altar. You need to leave your past transgressions. You can't take them with you and have a new life. You have to come with a pure heart and confess past transgressions and then leave them there. That's the problem with most of us is we easily throw our sin and shame on the altar, but when we're done, we pick it up and pack it and take us with us and carry it. That's not new. That's not even renewed. That's just putting a patch on an old piece of cloth or pouring this new wine into the same old wineskin. You get something in return, though, when you leave it. See, that's the good news, and that's the good part of the deal, is as you lay down your sin and your shame and your guilt and your faults and your failures, you receive forgiveness. You receive grace, mercy, unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You receive unconditional love. The bread which represents his body which was broken for you. He says take and eat. The cup which represents the blood of what? A new covenant. Not the old one. This one is new. It covers over all of your sins. Does what you cannot do for yourself. See Christ is offering. He's not offering the chance for you to be better. That's a misconception. He's not offering you the chance to be a better you. He's offering you the chance to be new. And just like the kids, would you rather have better or would you rather have new? See, with Jesus Christ, the impossible really does happen. You really, honestly, do get a clean slate. That's what Holy Communion is all about.